5. Defender of the Faith Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21 But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. But before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissemble likewise with him, inasmuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not prostrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. At the Council of Jerusalem, the Apostle faced the challenge of the Pharisees in the church who believed that Judaism was the mediator to Christ. Before becoming a Christian, a man had to be circumcised and to keep the law, and then he could become a Christian. The Council ruled against these Pharisees. The law is not the means of salvation, but of sanctification. To become a Christian means to know the grace of God through faith. Four simple requirements alone could precede baptism, three of them relating to diet, the fourth to sexuality. These requirements were a roadblock to antinomianism. If a man before baptism were unwilling to meet these simple things, how could he be baptised? Would he not be totally contemptuous of God's law thereafter? The apostles were seeking to do two things in their council decision. First, they denied that Judaism is the mediator to Christ or that salvation is by works of the law. The position taken by the Pharisees was unbiblical and faithless to the Old Testament. Second, while trying to prevent a work salvation, they were also seeking to forestall and ban antinomianism and any contempt for the law, and hence the requirements which they imposed. But, Paul tells us, the Pharisees, while compelled to give assent because of the stand of Peter, James and John, continued their attempted subversion by means of a less open and more devious strategy. Paul says that this led to serious problems in Antioch. The Judaizing Pharisees, or their representatives, came and influenced Peter, Barnabas and others, leading men to be dissembled and dissimulation. In the Greek, the word dissembled is sunapokrithesen, and dissimulation is hypocrisy. Both words are forms of hypocrisy or hypocrisy, a pretense this Phariseeism led to hypocrisy even on the part of these great leaders of the church. What was it that led to this hesitancy and then hypocrisy on the part of Peter, Barnabas and others? Was it an actual message from James, the brother of our Lord? 
The text in verse 12 does not say so. Robert Young's literal translation of the clause is this. For before the coming of certain from James, two other versions give these readings. Before certain persons came from James, he had been in the habit of eating with the Gentile converts. 20th century New Testament. It happened like this. Until the arrival of some of James's companions, he, Peter, was in the habit of eating his meals with the Gentiles. J.B. Phillips These men did not come with a specific message from James. Had they done so, Paul would have made clear his opinion of James's error, as he did Peter's. They may have been members of James's church or synagogue, assembly. Robertson commented that these men tried to give the impression that they represented James. No doubt these brethren threatened Peter to tell James and the church about his conduct. What was the problem? We are told that Peter had been eating with the Gentiles. Had Peter been eating blood or things strangled? As a lifelong Israelite, Peter would have been sickened at such food. No such charge of violating the mandate of the Council of Jerusalem is once mentioned. Had Peter been eating foods in violation of an order by the Council, which was largely of his own making, humanly speaking, Paul would say so, and Peter's critics would have made much of it. What then was the eating problem? It was forbidden and still is forbidden to Orthodox Jews to eat with Gentiles. Moreover, a variety of extra-biblical rules and regulations concerning utensils prevailed. Neither such eating nor such niceties with respect to utensils are biblical, although there is a superficial plausibility. There are some rules with respect to clean and unclean cooking. Also in Scripture, Eating is a form of communion both with God and man. It is a time for prayer and for fellowship. Among some peoples of antiquity and in some instances into the 20th century, eating with someone has been a treaty of peace or a covenant act. The Pharisees had taken these things and legislated all details to set up standards of superholiness and unwarranted separations. All this was for Peter and Barnabas, and the others as well, a grey area, and they reacted with confusion and hypocrisy. And all this was no small grief to Paul. These visitors were apparently people of note, distinguished Pharisees who were supposed converts. Lenski noted of verse 12, From James is scarcely the same route as from Jerusalem. These people were not sent by James, did not represent him. They were from the circle about James, in close association with him. They were persons of notes, or represented persons of notes. On the mission field, very often a prominent convert, even while having no position within the church, can exercise an undue influence because of his status and power. Paul a man of great note himself, was ready to deal with such men and best equipped to do so. He cites the Council of Jerusalem because it vindicated him. He now cites the Antioch incident because it again vindicated him. He reviews what is common knowledge to remind the Galatians that the cause of Paul is the apostolic faith. Men like Peter and Barnabas accepted Paul's rebuke and correction. Can the Galatians be so foolish as to think themselves wiser than Paul and the Apostles? The truth of the Gospel, verse 14. This is Paul's concern. He defends it against both Judaizers and against Antinomians. First, he declares plainly to the Pharisees and their adherents that a man is not justified by the works of the law that no man, Jew or Gentile, can be justified by the works of the law. Verse 16 The covenant privilege of the Jews is not another way of salvation than by the electing grace of God. 
The word justified has reference to a court of law. It is a legal term. Men stand justified before God's court not by anything other than the atonement of Jesus Christ. It is through the law, God's court and Christ's atonement, his death in our stead, that we are dead to the law. Verse 19. That is, we have been legally executed in the person of Christ for our sins. The law here means God's indictment of us and the death penalty passed against us. When a man is legally executed, that law or death penalty no longer has a case against him. The man is dead to the law. When we see ourselves as sinners before God, we are crucified with Christ, and Christ now lives in us, and we live in terms of his life, covenant, and law. We give ourselves to him who loved us and gave himself for us. Verse 20. Second, Paul speaks against the antinomians. In verse 17 he says, in the translation of Conibeer and Housen, But what if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we have indeed reduced ourselves also to the sinful status of unhallowed Gentiles? Is Christ then a minister of sin? God forbid. Lubbers comments on this. Paul now asks a very telling and arresting question. He asks, Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? It would seem that seeking to be justified by faith in Christ would need to lead to that conclusion. If there were absolutely no need to keep the law in order to be justified, then the law could be set aside and men could lead lawless lives. To that terrible position that seems the free grace in Christ must lead. Christ, instead of making men keepers of the law, makes men transgressors of the law by this teaching of the truth of the gospel. And so, Paul asks the question whether those who seek to be justified in Christ are not in the ministry of sin rather than in the ministry of grace. We must add that Paul thus closes the door to either a works religion, salvation by law, or an antinomian religion, quote-unquote grace, with lawlessness. As against the Pharisees, he says that a works salvation or salvation by law means that Christ is dead in vain. Why the death of God's incarnate Son if another way of salvation is possible? We cannot be made just by our own works, because this would place God in a position of obligation to us, a preposterous and blasphemous notion. Paul concludes, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Verse 21 The word frustrate is atheto, to make void. Paul's implication is clear. Anyone who relies on the law or works for justification is denying and making void the grace of God. Again, if any see God's grace as the denial of the law and its validity, they make Christ the minister of sin, verse 17, and thereby also deny or make void the grace of God. Such men in effect write a new Bible, or they will revise and edit the existing one, either eliminating most of the Old Testament or most of the new, as the case might be. Paul will not be such a transgressor. Verse 18. He will not rebuild the whole false structure of Phariseeism which he destroyed in Christ. He had pulled down the framework of Phariseeism. If he gave it any grounds, whether presented by Jewish notables or briefly assented to by Peter, Barnabas and others, he would prove himself to be a transgressor. Verse 19. 